The solidarity and social economy has become really a worldwide movement. How to guarantee the reproduction and development of life with dignity for all. We believe in the importance of connecting researchers from different countries and regions to provide a platform for bringing together diverse viewpoints, critical research, and often marginalized voices. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to follow up and play a role in translating the outcomes of this conference into research, into policy, and into action to achieve better strategies and interventions. The sequencing of the presentations has been very good this afternoon because that means uh, Cecilia gave you a summary of the empirical data which demonstrates uh, the risks and the uh, doubts surrounding some welfare mix, uh, mixes. So I'm actually finishing my presentation talking about a situation about uh, um, social policies that are being implemented in West Africa in a very specific area, which is that of social protection and um, health insurance. So our uh, presentations are very complementary. That's excellent. I'm not sure if that means that uh, we're being optimistic about uh, the policies, uh, social policies in West Africa. Uh, when you look at what's being done in other areas and see that the same um, trends are, are uh, developing. So the objective of my presentation is to talk about these policies that are being developed in a very innovative way in West Africa. They place high importance uh, on uh, solidarity-based economies. And uh, we need to talk about what lessons can be learned from a public perspective and from an economic and social perspective and in terms of solidarity. I'm going to attempt to give you some pieces of uh, information that allow you to grasp the situation and look at the doubts surrounding the feasibility and the risks um, related to these uh, social policies in West Africa. I'm sure you're well aware of this, particularly in this House, the International Labour Organization. The objective and the, of social protection and social protection as a subject is um, hitting the headlines of international organizations. And this is particularly the case for these low-income countries who have uh, social protection systems that ever since they have been created only managed to reach a small sector of the population because they were designed to cover um, people who had uh, formal, received formal wages. And we know how, uh, how large the informal economy in uh, most people work in this uh, at various levels of it or in the rural uh, sector so they work in a completely different manner and don't receive a formal, a formal form, form of social protection, so to speak. The phenomenon that we have been witnessing for quite some time, the specific nature of it, is that we are seeing um, some fairly far-reaching reform processes underway, not just uh, those that exist for officials and uh, those in the private sector, but also for the majority of the population, 80, 90 percent of them, who are not covered by any um, uh, any uh, official social protection. And all of these reforms of the social protection system are um, running parallel to another type of phenomenon, 
which is uh, a move towards uh, universal health coverage, health insurance that is being developed by the WHO, in particular in its 2010 report. Now, although we're spending a lot of time on developing these public policies for social protection, all the while these social actors are looking for ways of providing uh, social coverage to these populations. And that's what we've seen emerge in West Africa at the end of the 80s. A whole series of projects uh, undertaken on a local level and supported by international organizations or uh, foreign NGOs, and which led to the creation of a mutu uh, mutual systems, which are what, what we mean by a solidarity-based uh, structure. These are the characteristics of mutual health organizations. These are the definitions uh, of these organizations, and their objective is to improve access to health care through risk sharing and resource pooling. Any insurance body does this, and uh, these particular ones are not for non-profit, and they're done on the basis of members who benefit from the services, and they, at the same time, they own the organization, so they take the decisions related to the organization. These organizations um, are on the basis members decide whether they join them, and uh, the decisions are taken in a participative basis and uh, have certain control uh, mechanisms built in. So after 25 years of uh, development of these mutual health organizations in West Africa, where do we stand? A lot of initiatives on, in terms of economic and social policies in West Africa don't have statistics. What we know is that the, from the literature, we get really extreme figures about this phenomenon in the same group of countries. These figures have a very large range. And this is because there's been a lack of monitoring on a national level. And because there are weaknesses in general related to the way that these organizations are managed. So just a few global characteristics to describe what is currently underway with mutual health organizations. There are a lot of them. A lot of them have been created, but uh, they don't cover a lot of the population. Each one covers about 500 to 2,000 beneficiaries per organization. So from an insurance perspective, uh, spreading the risk uh, among such a limited number of uh, persons means that the risk is low. They're significantly reduced. It's low risk, often covered by first-level health organizations. And these are not the same uh, risks that would be incurred for a household, uh, for example. The risks that are really high are hospitals, uh, organizations, unexpected events that lead to much bigger expenditure, and these, of course, not covered by mutual health organizations. Another characteristic is 
that uh, the membership is quite homogenous. Why? Because these organizations uh, have often been put in place you know, on a community level using existing structures. Um, uh, servicing um, residents of a village, etc., which has consequences in terms of uh, adverse events and also in terms of vertical solidarity, because that means that we have a a very vulnerable group uh, who support each other, but uh, there isn't any vertical solidarity. What we've also noted is that obviously things have changed over the years. The situation uh, today is not as problematic as before, but uh, progress is slow, and there's still huge challenges to meet in terms of uh, becoming uh, professional, in terms of an organization, the certain products that they sell, and the way that they are governed in a participated manner. Another important aspect to be able to properly appreciate uh, what has happened with these policies and what is being discussed at the moment is the relationships that exist between the state and these um, same organizations, MHOs. What we have noted, the governments have uh, certainly not tried to stop the development of these organizations or them flourishing. And overall, in West Africa, states have acknowledged the potential of these MHOs quite rapidly and have uh, seen them as an option to extend social protection and improve access to health care. Uh, since uh, mid, the, in the mid uh, years of two th in the early 2000, in the early 2000, we saw a value placed on these MHOs by governments. We've also witnessed a certain number of conflicts and discussions uh, taking place between the ministers uh, who were supposed to uh, supervise the development of these MHOs. Sometimes they were quite opt opportunistic about their development and the type of ministry who, which was involved in uh, these MHOs, uh, social affairs, uh, social security, uh, the Ministry of the Interior, they were all involved. Uh, and uh, there was a great deal of discussion about how they should be viewed as civil society entities, um, as an entity with its place in the health system, a provider of social protection, etc. And the multiple identity that could be given to these um, solidarity based organizations. In recent years, in recent years, there has been an improvement in the regulations governing social and solidarity economy organizations. They've been adopted at the level of the West African Economic and Monetary Union, i.e. at a supranational level. And yet, if you try and understand how these organizations work, that's to say these mutual health organizations, how do they operate on a daily basis? How do they interact with health providers, well, then you see that there are s often difficult situations. It's a problem to get involved in a dialogue with uh, uh, care providers. It's difficult uh, to understand what problems exist in terms of the quality of care given. And also, it gives rise to questions as to liability and responsibility going beyond words uh, and uh, matching their words with deeds and actually playing a part and uh, taking a stance in terms of public policies, the states, that is, the nations. This, generally speaking, is the sort of pattern which is currently being discussed when it comes to health insurance in West Africa. This is a system which is currently being discussed for Burkina Faso, but uh, there are other systems which are very 
similar, very much like this one. The idea being as follows, in order to be able to extend coverage also to people in the rural or informal economy, you need intermediate organizations to reach out to them, to collect contributions, to conduct awareness campaigns and manage the system. And these intermediate organizations could well be existing mutual health organizations. They could perform that role. In other words, the organizations which I've just described as being fairly weak would find themselves in a situation where they would have to cover 80 to 90 percent of the population in countries with a very low level of income where the informal economy and the rural economy are so large. So this is a schematic diagram, which is, as I said, still the subject of debate, but will probably soon be adopted, represents a major step forward, also in terms of recognition by the authorities of the important role to be played by mutual health organizations. And unlike the situation we have in some countries of Latin America, it's not actually a political choice to promote uh, social and solidarity economy organizations. It's a matter of necessity. They need to rely on these organizations to be able to develop their public policies. But they note, nonetheless, that uh, this goes along with uh, certain risks uh, involving these organizations in the social and solidarity economy. They run a risk because of their financial weakness and the important role they're required to play in a public policy. So the concerns, which I won't repeat, are the same as those listed by Cecilia. The question of independence for social and solidarity economy organizations and the uh, risks involved the political role that they would need to play because they would be the advocates of certain representatives, certain members of the population. These are two characteristics which are particularly uh, important in the current situation. Thank you.